This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. In our top story, a serious escalation of violence in Gaza. At least 13 Islamic Jihad and Hamas terrorists were killed in the last 24 hours in multiple Israeli Air Force strikes in the north and south of the Gaza Strip. IBA's Eli Wagelanter has the details. Israel decided to strike back and strike back hard at Gaza following months of constant bombardment on the western Negev. The target of the first Israeli airstrike which blew up two cars in Gaza City late last night, was Majid Harazin, a senior Islamic Jihad terrorist who was in charge of rocket squads that had been firing in Israel. A spokesman for Islamic Jihad said Harazin was its top commander in the West Bank and Gaza and that he rarely traveled in cars for fear of an Israeli airstrike. A second aerial attack killed four other Islamic Jihad terrorists this morning as they walked out of a mosque in the Jabali refugee camp in northern Gaza. And in the West Bank town of Kabatya, near Jenin, a top jihad terrorist was killed in a gun battle with a special Israeli unit that came to arrest him. Deputy Defense Minister Matan Vilnai said he was, quote, very pleased with our achievements last night. But he added that the airstrikes were no alternative to a ground operation. Islamic Jihad sent an email to reporters saying it would retaliate for its losses with suicide attacks inside Israel. Broadcasting on a radio frequency used by Gaza terrorists, an Islamic Jihad official ordered fighters to turn off their mobile phones and remove their batteries to foil Israeli electronic tracking and to stay out of vehicles for fear of more aerial assaults. But it wasn't only Islamic Jihad that was a target. Israeli jets also struck a Hamas security position in Khan Yunus late this morning, killing at least two members of the group. The IDF said the attack was in response to 10 mortars and Qassams that were fired earlier today at southern Israel. No one was hurt on the Israeli side. The government said the strikes would continue. ارتفع عدد شهداء الفلسطينيين الذين سقطوا بنيران الاحتلال الإسرائيلي في قطاع غزة إلى The Israeli occupation has killed 11 Palestinian martyrs including nine leaders and members from Al-Quds Brigade, the military wing of the Islamic Jihad. They were killed in separate Israeli raids that took place in Gaza last night and this morning. The martyrs included Majid Al-Harazin, the chief of Al-Quds Brigades in Gaza. في قطاع غزة The Israeli military escalation in Gaza has never stopped. A number of people were killed and injured during a new Israeli raid that hit a police station of the ousted government in northern Gaza. This coincided with the funeral procession of nine other martyrs, four from the Al-Quds Brigade, including its chief, Majid al-Harazin. Crowds of people participated in the funeral procession, chanting phrases condemning the Israeli military escalation and international silence. Al-Harazin's daughter sent a message of vengeance to the Israelis. I say to Omert, the response is coming. Don't be happy just yet. I will carry out the next martyrdom operation myself. The Al-Quds Brigades also vowed to launch a new wave of martyrdom operations of a particular kind. The Palestinian resistance must respond with all the available means 
All options are open today, including suicide operations, God willing, deep inside the Zionist areas. The Israeli army said that it will intensify its attacks on Gaza, as well as their attacks on those who launch missiles at Israeli areas. Political observers said that Israel is using the internal division among Palestinians to attack Gaza. The Israeli policy of today is old. It continues the military escalation against the Palestinians, using the internal division among among them and the fact that Gaza is isolated. Israeli policy is aimed at deepening the Palestinian division, which explains why it called Gaza a hostile entity. Even during the Holy Eid al-Adha, Palestinians are being martyred. The Palestinians say that nothing is out of bounds for the Israelis. As the Israeli military escalation continues, the Palestinian determination to resist increases. Israeli planes launched three separate air raids last night. The first raid hit the chief of the Islamic Jihad military wing in Gaza, the Al-Quds brigades. The second raid hit a group that was in its technical department, and the third raid hit more of its members in northern Gaza. Samir Abu Shamala, Al Jazeera, Gaza, Palestine. Gaza, Palestine. During its weekly session, the Israeli government, through its Prime Minister Ehud Olmert, demanded that all cabinet members refrain from commenting on the Iranian nuclear program and the latest U.S. intelligence report. In addition, Olmert described the issue as sensitive and complicated. Meanwhile, Israel's internal security minister, Avi Dichter, harshly criticized the U.S. intelligence report for playing down Iran's nuclear program. Dichter said that the misguided U.S. concept regarding the Iranian nuclear program is liable to bring about a new war in the region. Amidst deep pessimism and cautious optimism, the Israelis express mixed reactions over an Israeli military intelligence report which will be submitted soon to the Israeli government. The report includes an evaluation and analysis of the political developments during the upcoming stage. The Israeli intelligence agency confirmed that Syria and Hezbollah were indeed able to enhance their military capabilities. The agency also warned that Israel may suffer a surprise attack over the next few years. However, this Israeli fear is gradually dissipating, especially after the Annapolis conference, which boosted the positions of the Arab moderates in the region. In addition, the involvement of Hezbollah and Damascus with the political developments in Lebanon has also lowered the bar of fear among the Israeli public. The intelligence agency confirmed that the Israeli Defense Force is still far superior to its counterparts. After the latest war in Lebanon, Hezbollah, through its secretary general, Hassan Nasrallah, said, had we known that there was a 1 percent chance that the kidnapping of two soldiers would have led to this, we would definitely not have done it. As the proverb goes, if you want to ask for advice, ask the expert, not the doctor. Nasrallah knows the price of the war. Meanwhile, on the Palestinian front, the ongoing Israeli blockade and the military escalation in the Gaza Strip have led to a positive outcome. This news comes as Hamas is trying to make a partial compromise which aims at ending the Israeli blockade and sparing the region yet another military confrontation. However, the situation on the ground is still fragile. This news comes as Hamas continues to improve its military capabilities, develop new rockets and shells, and prepare its fighters for a military confrontation with the Israeli army. All these factors make it rather difficult to find a political solution at this time time, as confirmed by the Israeli intelligence agency. We can't deny that some regional powers were able to enhance their capabilities. By the same token, we can't deny that Israel is suffering from a strategic problem. Israel wants to enter into Gaza, but it is afraid that it may repeat its shortcomings in Kana and Jenin, and this may lead to a public and international outcry. Israel also fears that it will not be able to withdraw easily from Gaza after completing its mission. According to the Israeli intelligence agency, Iran remains the main threat to Israel, especially since U.S. military action against Tehran has become less imminent in light of the latest U.S. intelligence report. In addition, imposing more serious sanctions against Tehran has become less likely, which leaves Israel alone to face the Iranian threat. The Israeli intelligence agency warned that Iran is capable of producing an atomic bomb by the year 2009.
The security assessment by the Israeli intelligence agency keeps the door open for all the possibilities, including a political showdown, followed by a possible military escalation against the various Palestinian resistance factions in Gaza. From Madar program Shirin Yunus, Abu Dhabi Channel, West Jerusalem. The Iraqi authorities have taken over the security file from the British forces in Basra after it had been under British control since March 2003. This comes amidst fears of the spread of militias in the oil-rich province. National Security Advisor Mofaq al rubai said that taking over the security file represents a victory for Iraqis against terrorism and an indication of the advanced capabilities of the Iraqi forces in terms of training. The Iraqi authorities officially took control over the security of the oil-rich Basra province in southern Iraq. This opens the way for a large number of British forces which number 5,000 in the region. A memorandum of understanding which transfers authority in Basra was signed by the governor of Basra, Mohammed al Ali, and the commander of British forces in Basra, Major General Graham Pierce. During the security handover ceremony, the National Security Advisor Muwafiq Rubai said on behalf of the Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki that the transfer of the security file today from the British forces represents a victory for Iraqis against terrorism. He added that the handing over of this file is an indication of the improvement in the capabilities of the Iraqi forces in terms of training. He reiterated that Iraq is prepared for this mission. <laughs> The handing over of responsibility for security in the Basra province means a lot to the Iraqi government. Basra has political and economic importance as well as strategic significance. During a surprise visit to the Basra province, the British Prime Minister Gordon Brown announced that British forces will hand over the security file of the province to the Iraqi forces after meeting with a group of British soldiers. The British soldiers, which number 5,550 troops and are based in the presidential palaces in the center of the city, handed over their headquarters on September 3rd. With this, they transferred over the complete security responsibilities within the city. 173 British soldiers have been killed in Iraq since the invasion in 2003. Until now, the British forces have handed over security authority to four provinces, Muthana, Thikar, Maysan, and Basra. After the handover, it is expected that the British forces will provide support to Iraqi security forces, particularly in monitoring Entering the borders with Iran. Last month, the British general confirmed that the Iraqi forces have complete control over Basra. The handover of control from the British to the Iraqis is a clear indication that Iraqis have achieved progress in securing their country. It is a step towards taking over the complete security file of Iraq. For Al Madar, Ali Hamza, Abu Dhabi TV, Basra. In a surprise visit to Iraq, the U.S. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice arrived in Kirkuk before heading to Baghdad. This news comes as the country is gearing up for a referendum to decide the fate of Kirkuk and whether to return it to the Kurdistan region or keep it under the administration of the central government in Baghdad. In an attempt to reassure the residents of Kirkuk, Rice talked about the reconstruction and the creation of jobs for the unemployed in the city. This news comes as Rice is expected to urge Iraqi rival political blocs to expedite the implementation of the National Reconciliation Initiative and take advantage of the decreased level of violence. Uh, we had a very excellent meeting. 
As Rice embarked on a political visit to Iraq, the Turkish military massed in northern Iraq. The Turkish army carried out an incursion and pushed nearly three kilometers deep into the Iraqi Kurdistan region. According to Iraqi sources, the Turkish invading force, which was armed with light military equipment, carried out a limited offensive in the mountainous region of Karlash along the Iraqi border. According to Turkish sources, clashes erupted between the invading forces and the PKK armed fighters. However, there were no reports of casualties. In addition, Ankara has shown new images of its warplanes carrying out raids in Kurdish villages in northern Iraq. Ankara wants to show the accuracy of its raids in an attempt to contradict earlier reports that its army has targeted civilians. In Jordan, the new government of Nader al-Dahabi received an unprecedented result during the vote of confidence session in the parliament. Ninety-seven parliamentarians approved the government, while 11 law makers voted against it. The new Jordanian government passed this test in the midst of widespread civil discontentment with the excessive rise in prices and poor economic conditions. Sawa el-Sawalka reports from Amman. The rise of prices is the hot topic in Jordan. Families can no longer bear the pressure of rising prices, nor can they bear to stay silent. As soon as we entered the home of one family, the neighbors all gathered in the same room, too, all of them looking for an outlet to express the harshness of life and the difficulties of providing food. We used to buy bread for half a Jordanian dinar, and it would last us all day, but now it went up to one JD. As you know, the situation is difficult with high prices. Everything is going up and we're in deep trouble. We can't afford to eat meat. We'll only taste it during the season of charity. That's it. We live on rice, sugar and lentils. But even the kilo of lentils is up to one JD. Gas is up, and we keep switching the heater on and off. We put our children under heavy covers to save a quarter of the gas, which costs us 1.75 JD. Anticipation, caution and pessimism are preoccupying people's minds. Their worries quickly revealed when talking about their living conditions. When you're making 150 to 200 JDs a month, what good is that when you're supporting 10 people? Oil prices are rising and so are basic commodities. How can a person bring in money and feed their children? Sometimes we can cut down on some things so as to be able to afford others, especially with the rise in petrol. In the parliament, the cold weather did not lower the hot demands of the parliamentarians. They focused on improving the living conditions of the citizens, raising their salaries and providing them with minimum requirements for living honorably within the limited means and resources of the country. The new government received a high degree of confidence from under the dome of the parliament. This grants the government the freedom to form policy and make decisions that touch the lives of all citizens. Over a week after Afghan and NATO forces recaptured a key town from the Taliban, the United States military has announced a wide-ranging review of its strategy in Afghanistan. Yes, with opinion polls suggesting growing Afghan support for the Taliban, U.S. Central Command is keen to win more trust from the people. So what's needed to achieve that? Well, Owen Fay took some of the concerns from Kabul streets and put them to the U.S. general who leads the NATO mission. The fundamental questions now being asked in Washington are the exact same questions that people here have been asking for the past six years. But the residents of Kabul rarely, if ever, get a chance to speak directly to the people who make decisions on their behalf. Al Jazeera took their questions to the head of NATO operations in this country so he could respond to their concerns firsthand. Why do innocent people always get killed in your military operations? We deeply regret any time that a non-combatant is harmed by our operations. But I would want this child to know that first, uh, we are not cavalier about what we do here, and we understand that we are here to help him. If the West is so technologically advanced that you can identify the natural resources we have here in Afghanistan, why can't you find Osama? Is he still alive? That would be, I would respond to the question by a question, because frankly, um, I have no compelling evidence that, say, that says Osama is still alive. Of course, I have no compelling evidence to say he's dead. I don't know. Is he, th is he that important? I'm not sure. I think his second in command is still alive, and I think he is important. But I also think they're very cagey. They're survivors. 
they've survived for a long time while they go about their misdeeds and evil. Why can't NATO stop SUSA bombings? They happen all the time. We do the best we can to head this off, and we have had some success working with our Afghan brothers. But we probably don't get enough help from the man who asked this question. Afghans know one thing for sure, when that there is a stranger amongst them, they know it about that quick. Afghans can help. And if he really wants to see change and see uh, a difference in these numbers, help and get all his brothers and sisters to help. Al Jazeera also spoke off camera to Taliban representatives who are simply demanding to know when foreign forces are finally going to leave Afghan soil. My message would certainly be to the insurgents that I do not see this alliance wavering. They understand why they're here. It's a noble calling. Uh, they're here at the invitation of the legitimate government of Afghanistan and the people of Afghanistan in constant or in polls seem to clearly want their help and so don't look for the alliance to walk off the battlefield. The alliance may not be walking off the battlefield, but how it conducts that battle is now under review. As Washington finally realizes that if it's going to put these questions to rest, its tactics here have got to change. Owen Fay, Al Jazeera, Kabul, Afghanistan. The level of violence has escalated in Somalia, where clashes erupted between Somali armed groups from one side and the Ethiopian-backed government forces on the other side. Six people, including three from the same family, were killed in the clashes. Meanwhile, the Somali president is seeking to form a new government in place of the transitional government formed nearly two weeks ago. These images show Somali armed groups attacking military bases of the Ethiopian-backed government forces in Mogadishu. In contrast, these images show the counterattacks of the joint forces on the bases of armed fighters in and around the Somali capital. This is how the Somali capital looked just two days before the Eid al-Adha holiday. We are pleading to both sides in the dispute to stop fighting and have mercy over the wounded women and children, including those admitted to hospitals or those taking refuge under trees. Meanwhile, clashes erupted between the armed fighters and the Ethiopian forces in the provinces of Hilowe and Houdin, south of the Somali capital of Mogadishu. Ethiopian forces shelled the Bakar marketplace, one of the largest commercial centers in southern Somalia, with heavy artillery killing and wounding wounding several civilians. Meanwhile, Somalia's Prime Minister Noor Hussein dissolved his transitional government just two weeks after its formation. Noor confirmed that a new ministerial cabinet will be formed during the next two weeks. This news comes as the international community mounts pressure on the transitional government in light of the ongoing violence in the country. Despite ongoing international and regional efforts exerted in Somalia, the security situation is still fragile and there have been signs of more violence and fighting to come. Meanwhile, violence continues to escalate in several areas in the central and southern parts of Somalia. From Mogadishu, Abed Rahman Abdi, Al Arabiya. Happy holidays amidst an awesome scene as more than two million pilgrims ascend the pure mount of Arafat to perform the greatest ritual of the Hajj. On the day of standing, the merciful God's guests spend their time in prayer and remembrance, chanting, Here I am, God, at your command. Then they will head to Muzdalife as the sun sets. They performed shortened versions of the noon and afternoon prayers. They listened to the Hajj sermon, which was given at the Namera Mosque, following the practice of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. عند شروق الشمس من اليوم التاسع من ذي الحجة 
As the sun rises on the ninth day of Dhul Hijjah, the pilgrims leave for Arafat, which is about 15 kilometers away from Mina. The pilgrims spend the entire day on Mount Arafat and listen to the Hajj sermon from the Namera Mosque. As the sun sets, the pilgrims head to Muzdalifa to perform the sunset and evening prayers. They will spend the night there until sunrise, and then they will head to Mina. An estimated three million pilgrims crowded Mount Arafat amidst chants of, Here I am, God, at your command. Many government agencies provided services to God's guests, transforming Arafat into a mid-sized city in terms of population. I swear to God, we witnessed excellent services which transported the pilgrims in a well-organized manner to this sacred place. We met spiritual leaders who serve this area and provide services to the pilgrims. The heat on the day of standing at Arafat compelled pilgrims to look for something in order to get by, for the time being, after finding no other means. But they did find everything available at Mount Arafat, including prepackaged light meals, which were offered by the private sector and do-gooders. All services are being provided to the pilgrims. May God reward them for everything. This year is better than previous years. There are no words to describe the services being provided by the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because it's making a great effort to ensure peace during this Hajj. So I ask that God Almighty reward it. Agencies collaborated in providing services to the pilgrims amidst different climates, which helped to ease the mission of the pilgrims on the day of standing at Arafat. Side by side with the government sectors, the private sector played its role in providing services to the pilgrims at the House of God, while also hoping that the pilgrims would pray for them. Abdullah Rakaf, Al Arabiya, Arafat. Who benefits? Our enemies benefit when we offer our condolences to those who suffered from these major catastrophes. We must remedy this through holding uprisings, our collaborative efforts and the coordination of all of our forces. Terrorism is a horrible catastrophe and it is a dangerous virus that does not aim for the truth. Its aim is chaos, genocide, doubt, and justification. So reject this terrorism. In an all-important message to the great Muslim congregation of Hajj, the Islamic Revolution leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei said Hajj is there each year to help Muslims line up against the pagans and defy enemy expansionist policies here and there. The leader said the Islamic awakening poses a grave threat to illegal interests and the uncalled for domination of the enemy in the world of Islam, adding unity and prudence on the part of Islamic nations need to go hand in hand to push back the invading enemy. Ayatollah Khamenei said any division in the ranks of Muslims should be treated as an invasive disease, adding the Iranian nation has come up with the hegemonic, uh, has come up with the magic bullet for that. The leader continued eagle-eyed Muslims have spotted cracks in Palestine, Lebanon, Iraq, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Ayatollah Khamenei said an awakening movement is gradually taking root in the entire Islamic world. At the end, uh, the leader said a future belongs to Muslims and that every single Muslim can do their share and bring it even closer. Among the Hajj pilgrims is President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad who arrived in the holy city of Mecca to perform the annual rituals. It comes after the Iranian president put on last night unstitched white robe for the ceremony in Medina. This morning, Ahmadinejad headed towards the desert of Arafat and also attended the disavowal of the pagan ceremony. President Ahmadinejad is in the Muslims' number one holy land at the official invitation of Saudi King Abdullah. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, 
the Mosaic Video Podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs programs which connect you to the world.